Hello everyone and welcome back to Engineer Tomorrow's Thermodynamics video series. This is video number 17 and today we're going to be continuing our discussion about specific heats uh, in our part twos of this introduction. So today what we're primarily going to focus on is discussing how specific heats actually affect uh, the different phases of a system. Okay, so different phases include um, your gases, you know, and we'll consider these ideal for our current discussion. All right, well, and then also solids, liquids. Okay, so the question is, how is it different? How do specific heats influence these different phases? Okay, and first we're going to start our discussion with the ideal gas. So in, in 1843, 1843, just so you know how far back this has been around, uh, the, sci or the scientist Joule, you know, the one who the energy, is, the energy term is named after, he demonstrated that for an ideal gas, the internal energy um, is solely a function of the temperature. So E is equal to Q is a function of uh, temperature. So function of temp temperature. Okay, and I want I want to kind of discuss how he actually did this. So what uh, Joel did was he had a big container. And inside of this container, he had two chambers that were connected by a valve. Okay, so I'll make this a valve. Okay, and so what he did was he filled up one of these valves. So he put air inside this valve. Okay, and this air was at high pressure. And this was at a low pressure. Okay, so essentially this was evacuated. He didn't really have anything in there. And what he did was he took the temperature of the system and he uh, essentially allowed it to reach thermal equilibrium. So allowed air to reach thermal Okay, and then just so you guys know, this on the outside, this is water. We have water on the outside. And essentially, what he did was he opened up the valve, change colors, open. Uh, he had some mechanism to open this valve without affecting the temperature of the system. And so what happened was pressure stabilized. Okay, and throughout this, uh, this process, he was still measuring the temperature of the system. Okay, so what happened? when he took this measurement. So what happened was temperature did not change. Did not. Change. Okay, so ultimately what this told you is if you know there's a certain amount of energy in the air when it's spread out, you know, when there's some sort of change in pressure of the system or change in volume, it's not going to affect the energy of the system as you could see by the temperature that was that was taken, the temperature measurement that was taken at that uh, external part of the container, okay? So the temperature did not change after he waited, you know, he waited for a long time to make sure that thermal equilibrium and it, and it still hadn't changed, okay? So essentially what that said is 
for an ideal gas. Uh, the in internal energy is purely a function of time or of temperature. Okay, so change colors again. So now let's let's take a look at what happens uh, for an open system. Okay, using this definition that we have for the ideal gas. So for an open system, we know we use enthalpy instead of uh, internal energy, and the definition for enthalpy is the internal energy plus pressure times a specific volume, okay, on a per unit mass basis. Okay, so if we use the ideal gas law, okay, what we determine is that H is a function of U, which is a function of temperature, plus the ideal gas constant of the specific gas times the temperature. Okay, so this is also a function of temperature. So what does it tell you? That says that the enthalpy is going to be a function of temperature. Okay, and that's, that's an important assumption. And what this allows you to do is to use your specific heat you know, constant volume or specific heat at constant pressure to make calculations of internal en or of changes in energy in the system. Regardless of if they're open or closed, you know that for an ideal gas, the change in energy is going to be a function of the change in temperature. Okay, so just uh, to reiterate, okay, previously we said that the control, uh, Specific heat constant volume is partial U or partial T constant volume. And last time I said T U over DT, but that was incorrect. So essentially, we need to say that since this, this U could be a function of a bunch of other different things, so we, the partial of U with part, with this, uh, divided by the partial T is the definition for the uh, specific heat constant volume. Okay, but with the newfound information for the ideal gases, we know that it is solely a function of temperature. So this allows us to say that Cv is equal to du over dt. Okay, and that, that's what I wrote last time. Um, just know that this is valid for ideal gases uh, because of that discussion that we just had. Okay, and again, du, this specific heat constant volume, dt. Okay, and the same for the, the pressure one. So we had partial h, or partial t, uh, constant pressure. That leads to cp equals dh over dt, because we know that the ideal gas is a function of temperature only, um, and we also get dh equals C B D T. sorry, it should be a capital T, okay, so now let's, you know, say we want to know that we know the change in, or the enthalpy at different stages, so we can take the integral of both of these relationships. So what do we get? We say uh, the integral of du, you know, from one to two is u two minus u one. Okay, and then that's the integral of c v dt. Okay, so this c v it's a function of temperature, so integral C V, which is a function of temperature times dt. Okay, and if uh, if we make the assumption that this is a constant term, which is often done by 
is taking the average temperature and looking for the specific heat and constant volume for that given temperature. Um, you can actually take that term out, so you can say C V average uh, times T two minus T three. Okay, and you got to be careful when you make that assumption and take out the C V average, but generally it's acceptable to make that assumption. Okay, so again, let's do that with the enthalpy term. So we're gonna go from one to two dH. Equal to H2 minus H1. That's equal to the integral from 1 to 2. It should have been 1 to 2. Of Cp, which is a function of temperature. Let me just put that in there. Dt. Okay, and you know if we take, if we assume that this is an average term, we say Cp average T2 minus T1. Okay, so that's it's excellent if you have a open or closed system and you have a uh, so let's say Q minus W equals U change in U. Okay, well that U two minus U one is right here. So we can substitute that in to get the changes in energy. Using temperatures. Okay, and the same for an open system, we can say Q minus W equals change in H. So it should be lowercase because we're doing only per unit mass. And that's equal to CP average T2 equals T1. Okay. Um, so, additionally, there is a relationship between CP and CU. Okay. So, to determine what that value is, we'll use the relationship we did, or the relationship between uh, DH and DU. So, if you remember from our previous discussion, uh, DH is equal to DU plus um, dd is over volume, okay, but that ends up being the u plus r dt, because it's a function of temperature, okay, and all right, let's substitute what we know for dh and for u, so that ends up being uh, cp dt, equals C B D T plus R D T. Well D T's cancel out and you get C P equals C V plus R. Okay, and that's that's great. Now you have a relationship between uh, the two values that you can use. Okay, and you can do that on a per per mole bat per mole uh, base as well by just using the ideal gas constant for the molar value and that's just the one with the bar on top of it. So let me define another property. So this is a specific heat ratio and that's equal to Cp over C. And this value is always going to be greater than 1 because Cp is greater than, sorry, greater than or equal to 1. But for the case of ideal gases, we know Cp is always going to be greater than Cv, okay, because they are different values. Um, so we can also rewrite this as K equals Cv plus R divided by Cv, okay, and rearranging that, it's also equal to 1 plus R over Cv, okay, so we can say that Cv equals R divided by K minus 1. Okay, and sometimes you're given this K term, so now you have a way that you can determine what Cv is. And just, just so you know, uh, the K term is often used by ME, ME students or ME graduates and gamma 
This is the AOE Aerospace. This, sorry, Aerospace Engineers or Ocean Engineers. Okay, so um, I guess that, that kind of wraps up our discussion for ideal gas. Uh, let's take a look at what happens to liquids and solids as well. Okay, so for for liquids and solids, we generally assume that um, let me just get the pen. Um, liquids and solids. Are incompressible. So, what does that mean? That means that the specific volume doesn't change. Okay, and this isn't always true. You know, sometimes you have liquids that are compressible, and this assumption falls apart. But generally, the incompressible assumption is a good assumption. Okay, so what happens is uh, CP equals CV, so we just define that as, okay, so the internal energy becomes um, DU equals C, which is a function of temperature, times DT, okay, which we can say that um, delta U, which is equal to U2 minus U1, equals C average. T2 minus T1. Okay, so now what you what you find is that li for liquids and solids, uh, the enthalpy uh, is no longer pressure dependent. Okay, so if you saying if you have it like an uh, in an open system, so H equals U plus E V. Okay, so we find that the H equals the U plus the EV. Yep, so that's equal to the U plus, oops, sorry, specific volume PP plus EV. Right, so this goes to zero. So you end up getting delta H equals delta U plus specific volume change in pressure, which is approximately equal to C average change in temperature plus specific volume change in pressure. Okay, so just just remember that um, for the enthalpy at a specific pressure temperature for a liquid approximately equal to um, H of that fluid at at that given temperature plus the specific volume of fluid at that given temperature times P times P saturated. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of how you can tackle problems um, depending on if you know if it's a liquid, a solid, or an ideal gas, um, which are generally what you run into in thermodynamics problems. So I hope that was helpful. Um, please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Leave them in the comment section, and I'd be more than happy to help you. Uh, thank you very much for watching.